Hello and welcome to the offload here on Papare. The offload is where we're going to look back at the week that was uh, the week, the first week indeed of the Rugby World Cup 2015. And it has been a frenetic weekend. Uh, we started off with England versus Fiji, the opening game. And to talk about that game and the biggest upset in the history of Rugby Union, I've got in the studio uh, with me uh, two brothers. We uh, Brothers are a common... Uh, uh, common thread in rugby, of course. Uh, you form brotherhoods on the field, but these guys have been uh, had that brotherhood formed way before that. Uh, Jeevan and Jayan Gunitilaka, thanks for joining us here on the Papare on the offload. It's been a superb opening. Uh, let's talk about the first match, England versus Fiji. It was almost as if Jaco Piper didn't want there to be an upset on his watch. Uh, Jayan, I'll give that one to you. Uh, there was a lot of tentativeness in the, in the way he refereed. There's a lot of tentativeness in the way England played. Uh, and Fiji also let themselves down. Yeah, you uh, got the impression that uh, perhaps the occasion got to Jakob Piper in, uh, in certain ways. Uh, so many people watching at the stadium the world over. And uh, I think the, the television match official came into play about six times, Sharnaka, and uh, it, it took forever, eternity for, for the first half to finish. So there were a few uh, calls that, uh, or a few interruptions that the game could have done without. And my immediate reaction was, oh my gosh, is this going to be how the World Cup's going to go, where we have uh, the match being stopped uh, for, for some pretty petty, petty uh, uh, referrals as well. But uh, looking at other games, it was just one of those things. And uh, well, the right decisions were made, Shanaka, to be fair by him, but uh, he could have done a lot better. Well, the right decisions were made. Let's agree to disagree on that. We'll have the highlights coming up in uh, just a moment. Uh, but Jivan, uh, uh, what Jayan is referring to as a right decision was uh, Matawalu's try being disallowed. Now, I think that ball went straight down. Uh, the knock-on law, I mean, I'll ask this from you because you're a lawyer as well. Uh, the law says clearly that it has to go forward off the hand towards the defending team's deadline. In my estimation, it didn't go towards the opponent's deadline, it went straight down. And there's no requirement, a lot of commentators, even international commentators say you need to have possession, you need to have control, you need to have downward pressure. None of that is true. You still think no try? I would say it's no try. I mean, looking at it um, in super slow-mo, uh, it's no try. If I had to make a call, just looking at it at a glance, I'd say there's no try and I think the referee got it right. I mean, the referee got it wrong, but then he was overruled um, with the match official. Uh, purely because, you know, if you, if you uh, Look at it, you know, apart from what the law says, Shanaka, how do you, where do you close the door on that? If you allowed that, you know, he had no control. He dropped the ball. It was, most like, it was almost like a basketball movement. They dropped it and then he controlled the ball with the hand. So if you allowed that try, then that leaves room for arguments to be raised in certain other tries, mm -hmm. right? And this will form a precedent and then you're going to have an issue. So I think it's... Every law you have to you have to apply it practically, and that's even yeah, I think even go. the rules. That's, yeah, that's exactly the uh, moment right now. And to the naked eye, it just uh, didn't look like it. Uh, here we see. This is the one. It drops about three Shanika, inches. That's, to the that's a knock floor. on any day of the week. Oh, exactly. exactly. I don't know three, what you're on about. Three, three yeah. inches to the floor, yeah. <laughs> and the guy touches it almost before it comes back off the ground. Well, let me just put it this way: you know, if Argentina scored a try like that against the All Blacks, you'd probably say it was no try. <laughs> 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 Let's move swiftly <laughs> along there, shall we? And when it comes to the last try, the bonus point, the crucial try that um, uh, England needed, Jan, to make sure that they had uh, some uh, headway in the group of death, that try again, three camera angles inconclusive as to whether it crossed the line. One camera angle from a dubious angle from behind the ball shows that it did cross the line. Do you think that should have been awarded? I, I think it was. And I think, you know, as a player, you definitely know whether you scored or not. And uh, uh, judging by the body language of the players on the park at the time, uh, it, it was a try for all money. And um, I think that one was, uh, again, something that the television match official got right. Uh, I mean, I don't dispute any of the calls, Shanaka, but I think in certain cases, uh, probably the, the official got a bit too involved with the game. And there were some petty, petty decisions made in terms of not rolling, uh, not using your arms and so on that had no real bearing on the game. Mm -hmm. So that's something I believe the, need, the, the referees need to look at. But as far as the tries that were awarded and the try that wasn't allowed, I think they, they got those spot on. Okay, so uh, that's uh, one aspect of the game that we haven't really talked about before, uh, Jeevan, the aspect of the referees. As much as the players are going to decide who wins this World Cup, the referees are going to play a huge part in this as well. Oh, definitely. I think, um, you know, referees, you know, have a big say, especially at this level of competition where the, the difference between the teams is, is so minimal. You know, so a call here and there, you know, 
can go can go a long way. I mean, for example, 2007, the All Blacks dumping at the hands of uh, Wayne Barnes. You know, it was a referee's call. I think even even the 2007 World Cup final was there was a referee's call, a touch and go call, which Mark went the Quito, other way. Exactly, Mark Quaid to touch down. So when the competition is this close, you know, the referees play a big big role, and the calls that they make, you know, will have will undoubtedly have an impact on the game. As as coaches, we always tell teams, you know, you know, our teams that we coach, you know, that you know, you have to play in a way where you put the referee out of the equation. Right? It's not that the referee is biased or the referee is, is... It's just that that's the way, you know, the referee is a human being, they get it wrong. But of course, at this level, you've got so many eyes on the ball, you've got assistant referees, you've got a TMO, you've got a separate TMO watching foul play. So it's a bit more control, or there's, there's, there's more chances for them to get it right than wrong. But still, you know, just like this try issue, you know, it's always subject to interpretation. One referee would probably say it's a try, another won't. It all depends on who controls it on the day. Well, let's move on to the other game in Group A. We had uh, Wales taking on Uruguay, and despite the best efforts of uh, their fly half, uh, Felipe Barquesi, I thought was absolutely outstanding in uh, that game, but he managed to score just a nine points for his team. Wales racked up 54, Corey Allen scoring a first half hat trick, but uh, Jan, he's no longer in the fray. He's out of the squad with a hamstring strain, and then Liam Williams will be available, but he had a dead leg as well. And so many guys out. Do you think Wales have it in them to meet England this Saturday? Uh, you really have to feel for them, no, Shanaka? I mean, uh, it never rains, it pours. Uh, and Warren Gatlin, uh, his side and his, his wider pool is, is running paper thin now in terms of resources and, and players in key places. Uh, Corey Allen played fabulously well on the outside uh, centre channel and he's already without, you know, Jonathan Davies and uh, without Lee Halfpenny and, you know, he's got front up against England on Saturday. And we all know what England's going to do. They're going to use their big centers. They're going to punch holes. And uh, that's going to be effectively their World Cup final in many respects to determine if they're going to go through. So uh, I think Wales is going to struggle to, to front up if you really ask, uh, if, if you ask me, Shanaka. And uh, because rugby today, as you know, it's an 80-minute game like we saw in the other games. Uh, it's not just the 15 players on the, on, on the park, but who do you bring on to, to create that impact? And that's where Wales is going to have a problem. Well, that's uh, Wales going to have a bit, bit, bit of an issue. Yeah, but if I can add to that, I think if um, uh, going back to Warren Gatlin and Wales, I think um, he'd probably say that Brandon O'Driscoll should play now. <laughs> if he could take Brandon O'Driscoll and play for Wales, he'd probably take him now. He probably would, but yeah. then you can't argue with his decision. They won that match by 40-something points uh, against the <laughs> they Lions. They were always going to win that match, Sean. <laughs> the Lions against yeah. Australia. Moving now to Group B, where we saw the greatest upset in the history of Rugby Union. I don't think I'm overstating that when I say that Japan, 15th place team in the world, beating the giant South Africa, the third place team in the world. It was just an outstanding performance, 34 points uh, to 32. Eddie Jones' side actually coming through and winning that one in the last move of the game. They showed the belief, they showed that they wanted to win the game, spurned the chance of three points to try it, although Goromaru was hitting beautifully, but they actually went for the win and they got it and that's a great uh, it's a great advertisement for asian rugby isn't it guys and probably just one of the best results of the tournament oh definitely shanaga you know i mean uh, uh, the win was fantastic the, more than the win the rugby the quality of the rugby was just superlative you know i, I mean just watching it as a as a as a as a person who's not south african or japanese as an independent person you know the rugby was just superb you know everything that technically or the flair, it had everything that you would want in a rugby game. And the consequences of the win actually are, are far-reaching, you know, mm. because the next World Cup is in Japan. So Japan does well there, they'll do here well here obviously, and if they can take that forward in the next one, then who knows, from an Asian perspective, we may see, you know, shouts of the inclusion of a second Asian team, you know, so there's, there's everything, you know, this win has so many good things for Asian rugby, you know, apart from the fact that they created history. Uh, Jayan, talking about the technicalities of the game, the ball presentation was outstanding. They conceded only two tries, uh, sorry, two scrums to South Africa. They conceded only about six or seven penalties and only two of them were in their own half. So Pat Lambie had only two shots at goal. How do you manage to keep a side uh, so disciplined and so brilliant in their execution? Well, um, you know, talking uh, to Eddie Jones, after the game, uh, in the interview he conducted, uh, he, he did state that this has been four years in the making. So, I mean, what you saw that day was a product of a lot of thought, a lot of planning that has gone into it, Shanaka. And, uh, I mean, that's just Japanese efficiency at its best. You saw them at the breakdown, they knew exactly what to do, they knew not to overcommit, 
to to chop them low down, chop the ball carrier low down, and and just fan out and and just just don't give them any yardage. You know, uh, even with the kickoffs, they they just grubber the ball through, uh, not giving enough time for the South Africans to really make their weight count, Shanaka. So every single element of the game, every single facet of uh, the South African game plan, if you could put it that way, was was checked by the Japanese. And uh, I think that just shows that even smaller nations, uh, teams that struggle a bit when it comes to you know the the buff and the weight, uh, they they can play rugby and they can compete compete at this elite level. Uh, we had uh, the statistic that six foot four was the average height of the South African team, and it was also the height of the tallest player on the Japanese team. So you go back and tell your the kids you coach, look, these guys can do it, you can too. Yeah, correct, Shanaka. You know, it, uh, like Jain also said, you know. Um, uh, this goes to show that it's not all about size. You know, the, the excuse that we give, you know, for if you look at our domestic structure, we look, as for Sri Lanka not progressing on the global scale, you know, it's very easy to say, you know, but we're small made, you know. But that's not the case. You know, you look at Japan, you know, you look at every World Cup, they have got considerably better. You know, they've targeted this one, they're definitely targeting the next, you know. They work around it. You know, you look at their game plan, you know, you look at the way they have studied the opposition and the way they play. As Eddie Jones said, with a team like this, there's only one way you can play. Mm. So, you can make exceptions. Yes, of course, you are at a disadvantage, but if you are smaller, then you are quicker, you know, and you, you, you come up with a game plan that suits you, like the Japanese did, right? So, this augurs well for, a, for, you know, the sport, it's a good advertisement on a global scale, you know. It's a lot of thought that rugby is, you know, where is Sri Lanka, why are we bothered, it's a, it's a you know, Western dominated sport. It's not the case, and the Japanese just proved that they beat the Springboks. I mean, it's not just a... And if you look at the game, it's it's not a flash in the pan or 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 or, 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 or something that uh, you know was um, uh, was uh, a lucky by chance offer. They dominated the game, Chana. Yeah. They played better rugby. 80 minutes. This is not a seven-a-side contest. This is not a 2020 affair. They played better rugby for 80 minutes, which is not easy. Yeah, and the try they scored, the second last try that they scored, the one that was scored by the fullback Goromaru, none of the ball carriers actually were touched. They offloaded just in time, and the passing was crisp. It was a complex move, but they still managed to score it with a man to spare on the outside. I mean, that is the stuff of legend. I have to agree with you, Shanaka. I thought Samoa was, uh, their performance was well under par. Uh, if you look at the Samoa side, they have players playing in the best leagues in the world. They have, like, for example, Tim, Ni Tim Nainai Williams playing in the Super 15. Uh, we had the 2C, uh, 2C, and PC, 2C, uh, 2C PC and PC. George PC, uh, the brothers playing for Northampton, which is a, a top tier English side. So I was expecting a lot more because this is a, a tried and tested, a battle hardened Samoan side. And to uh, you know win by the margin they, they did win by against USA uh, was very disappointing because they, being in a, in a tough group, they should have targeted to, to somehow get a bonus point and, and really make a statement at this tournament. And that opportunity went by, Shanaka. Uh, maybe they're not playing their, their, their best side, maybe they're not, but uh, it, it was a disappointing start for Samoa. Yeah, it was. And uh, looking at the group, now that Japan has blown it wide open, that bonus point would have really helped them to try and go through to the quarterfinals because now Scotland are also in with a chance, uh, Jivan. So, you know, you leave these things behind. Oh, definitely, yes. You know, these are, these are opportunities that you will definitely rue later on in the tournament, you know, especially when a lesser team like Japan has come and just thrown it wide open. You know, every point, you know, not leave alone a point, I think every, any, any try is going to be vital. And when you do play teams that which, which you can um, score against, you know, then you've got, to, you've got to make the most of it, you know. Maybe, like Giant said, if Samoa played a second string side, if the Japan game was played earlier on in the evening, mm -hmm. they would have probably switched it around and played their first side. Because you know that now, every point is going to count, yeah. you know. And there are two ways of looking at it. Some teams like to play the lesser teams up front and then work towards the tougher teams. Or you play the tough team at the start and then you work towards piling on the points, you know, in the, onto the lesser known teams. Yeah. So it works both ways. You know, as to which one is better, well, it all depends on the team, it all depends on the circumstances. But definitely, uh, Samoa is going to rule the fact that they only scored 25 points. So has Samoa shot themselves in the foot or not? We'll notice uh, in time to come. Moving on to Group C, we'll start with the upset in Group C uh, first, and that's Georgia versus Tonga. And uh, Georgia actually is a team ranked well below Tonga. Tonga, a team that beat France, who were World Cup finalists last time, by uh, 17 points to 10. The Georgian team, uh, led by their captain, uh, Momotsuke, who was absolutely outstanding, pretty much took them on single-handedly. Uh, but Tonga will really be upset by that result. 
Yeah, Shanaka Tonga, I mean, Tonga performed very well at the last World Cup. Uh, they didn't get to the quarterfinals, but they signed off having beaten uh, the French in style. So uh, with, with the likes of Fiji, with the likes of uh, Samoa, you know, coming out to play, Tonga would have really wanted to, to really make a statement as well. And to lose to Georgia, they'll be, they'll be bitterly disappointed about that, Shanaka. Uh, because uh, Tonga, you know, they have a probably a richer rugby heritage than, than Georgia. They have more, more players playing uh, in, in top leagues around the world. And Georgia is a side made up of uh, more part-timers than professionals. So to lose to Georgia... Well, actually, on that, on that front, uh, Giant, Fiji is a team that has the most amount of players playing in foreign leagues in 26 clubs across the world. In fact, Georgia are second place there. They've got uh, players representing 24 clubs across Europe. Okay. So that might be one of the reasons. Yeah, possibly. So they've obviously then they've you know it shows that they've uh, swum under the radar, so to speak. Mm. So I mean, uh, they they might cause a few upsets. I mean, if, if uh, they had the better of Tonga, but what happens now is teams will be alive to that fact, Shanaka, yeah. and they won't be taking them uh, you know lightly, and they'll they'll be coming there to play. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing about this. Uh Rugby World Cup as opposed to Cricket World Cups, you can't take any team uh, lightly. And I don't think New Zealand did when they ran out against Argentina. Everybody who was watching, not everybody, but many people who were watching were expecting the All Blacks to steamroll a football-playing nation. That's the sort yeah. of conception that they had. But Argentina really turned up, didn't they, Jivan? Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, I mean, um, uh, well, looking at the crowd that turned out for them, you know, Wembley Stadium, 90,000 people, most of them Argentine support. You know, how could you not turn up? We've forgotten you know? the Falklands. Exactly, you know, exactly. I mean, you know, <laughs> forget about the Falklands, you know. <laughs> Jeez, who needs the Falklands when you have Emily, you know? I mean, so they did turn up. And for 60 minutes, they were, they were very much in it. But uh, the All Blacks were just too, the quality of the All Blacks was such that, you know, they were just too good. You know, and I feel for the, for the Pumas because they actually threw everything they had. And for their sake, I hope they still have kept something back in the tank because from a tactical perspective, you would expect them to come second in the group. I mean, it's it's probably not as intense as the rest of the groups. So, they are virtually guaranteed a second uh, a quarter-final berth if they can hang on to number two. But having said that, they were not complacent and they gave it their all and it was a treat to watch. Yeah, it was a great uh, game of rugby. Selection-wise, uh, giant for Steven Hansen. Is there something that he needs to change up? I think so. I think Maanonu needs to go out of the match day 23, uh, really, and bring Malakai Fekitoa in there. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, well, I think uh, I think Sonny Bill Williams really put his hand up and made a case for selection, uh, made a case to start the game. Uh, Manu, like you said, didn't really exactly cow himself in glory, Shanaka. I thought he was very slow to react. I thought he was, uh, he, he seemed to lack that bit of zip. Uh, but there are some changes that would happen, I believe. Uh, Nehe Milner Scudder, he, I think he has a lot of promise, but he, he spurned a, a golden opportunity to score. Jeevan's uh, favourite player. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, opinion is obviously divided here on his ability <laughs> and his suitability to the All Black setup. But uh, I think there will be a few changes happening along the way. But uh, the core of the side would still possibly remain the same. I think their, their forwards are pretty much settled. They know what their best combination is. I think Aaron Smith is arguably the best scrum half in the world today. So, uh, and they've got Dan Carter playing, uh, you know, the best rugby he's played in, in recent times. So I think the core of the side will remain the same. It's just that I think number 12 is a problem. Who they play out uh, wide on the, on the left wing is a bit of a concern. But uh, that aside, well, I mean, they've got two games against Namibia and, and uh, mm -hmm. the other group, uh, other side. So they've got two chances to really test and uh, look at another combination. But I think the core of the side will remain the same, Shankar. Yeah. yeah, I think Jayan brought a very valid point. I think, uh, you know, uh, Ma no, no, you know, it's... As opposed to just looking at individuals, I think uh, Steve Hansen's theories, he goes for combinations. Mm. I mean, Ma Nonu and, and uh, Conrad Smith are the most capped centre pairing in the world. So that's what they're looking at. They're looking at starting off and getting that stability going. And then you have the Sunny Bill Williams, the, the, you know, the more, the, the flair and all coming on in the second half. But I think that is the reason why he's going. It's not because he wants to play Ma Nonu, but I think he's very keen in keeping that combination going up front. And I, I actually personally will be very surprised if Ma Nonu and Conrad Smith don't start in the quarter-final. Oh. One thing that did come out of that game, the controversial yellow card for Richie McCaw and then another one for Conrad Smith. I don't think there was any controversy. It was a yellow card uh, every day of the week. Uh, but uh, the reaction to it, were you surprised? Uh, no, actually. I was, um, 
you know, watching it, I was surprised that uh, Richie Mokka would do that. But then um, uh, that's that's probably because of the perception we have of Richie Mako. You know, he's like you know he's like you know he's such a huge figure in world rugby. But uh, looking um, inwardly, I mean, we've all done it, Shanaka. I mean, it's all you know off the ball. All these things happen. The only difference now is that it gets noticed because mm -hmm. there are so many cameras on you. So whether it's Richie Mako, end of the day, he's a rugby player. He's a seasoned rugby player, and it it happens in every game. But unfortunately, the the crowd uh, took it out on him, and uh, which was probably unfairly so. But um, I don't think he's going to uh, lose any sleep over it either. I don't know. I think he looked a little upset sitting in that bin, Jayan. Do you think that will affect uh, the All Blacks a little bit and make them actually uh, rise to the occasion more? Well, when uh, Richie McCaw flew all the way from New Zealand to, to England for the World Cup, I don't think at any point he would have thought that there would have been uh, a stadium packed of 90,000 people and a majority of them booing him, uh, you know, for, for, uh, for whatever reason. But uh, yeah, he did. I have to agree with you, Shanaka. I, I thought it, uh, he, he did look a bit embarrassed about it. And uh, you know, when you're sitting in a sin bin for 10 minutes and the whole stadium's seeing what you did on the screen and, and boo at you, there's really nowhere to go, is there? Uh, so, uh, you know, he's going to be more mindful now, I think, you know. But, uh, you know, it, it's just one of those things because if, if there was no replay, I don't think anyone really caught it at, mm. uh, you know, uh, at, at, normal, uh, at normal time. So, uh, well, he's going, to, he's going to be more mindful of that now and uh, know that uh, it, it's, it, it's going to be something that teams and referees alike will, will look out for. Yeah, and I think a lot of the players will have to realize that uh, what's going to happen is that a lot of the stuff that they do off the ball might come back to bite them in a few seconds' time. So we might actually see a few of those incidences uh, going on uh, later on in the tournament as well. Moving it's a difficult quick... thing to do, Sean, having said that, when you're a, you know, a, a third mm. row forward mm. and you're on the ground and you see someone, you know, <laughs> you know, instinctively things tend to happen on a rugby field, and I, I mean, it's I've not like, it, like it. it's not like you try to maim anyone. It's not like you try to eye gouge anyone. You know, it's not like anyone died. But uh, well, it's he's Richie Mako. Yeah. It's just uh, you know, like Tano Magawan said, it's not Tiddly Winks. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, Brian O'Driscoll disagreed <laughs> vehemently, I think. Uh, but when you go back, just on the subject, uh, you go back uh, to 2011, and Mako himself got very obviously gouged by Orly and Rujeri in that uh, final, but nothing happened. So it's good that at least we're erring on this side of the fence here. Uh, well, Shanaka, uh, there are two ways you can look at it. I mean, if I were to play under these rules and under such scrutiny, I would say that rugby wasn't fun anymore. You know, but um, um, uh, that apart, you know, I think, yes, definitely. Things like eye gouging and serious uh, uh, misdemeanors and tip tackles and all, which put your physical health in serious jeopardy, has to be outlawed. That's the only way you can make it universal. And at the end of the day, it's bad for the sport if things like that are not looked into and serious injury occurs. But at the same time, you know, it does slow the game down, right? I mean, there are certain incidents, you know, which probably draw too much of attention. But when you balance it out, I suppose, you know, the greater evil is, prevailed, is, is, is prevented from happening. So in that sense, yeah, I have to agree with you, Shanaka. Yeah, so let's see. I'm sure it's the first time they're doing this, so they'll find the balance uh, eventually. Uh, the quick look at uh, Group D, Ireland uh, smashing Canada by 50 points to 7. But again, Fiji had a 48-10 or something victory, a giant over Fiji at Twickenham a few weeks ago. So is Ireland really setting out a marker here? Yeah, Ireland was, uh, when they played England uh, a few weeks ago in that final warm-up game, they were very poor. And you got the sense that they were not trying to show their hand and, and keep their cards very close to their chest. But uh, they showed that they can play an expansive game. They showed that they have the running game to, to cope with, uh, with any other team in Europe or, or even in, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. So it was a good uh, run out for the Irish, I thought, and they were able to, to uh, really get some momentum, Shanaka. I think the World Cup is all about momentum, mm. especially when you're in a tight group and they have France and Italy who they have to be to, to, uh, to be certain of advancing. So I thought it was a good game to have first up. Uh, Canada was was not the best. It, it wasn't the best Canadian side that has shown up for a World Cup, but uh, but they competed, and I thought Ireland would be very very happy with the result, Shanaka. Okay, and uh, looking at the other game in uh, Group D, our final look uh, for the weekend: France versus Italy, 32-10. 
uh, Italy without Sergio Parise, unfortunately, and uh, also losing Andrea Masi early in that game, probably will never play rugby again. He's torn his uh, Achilles tendon, and uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, Italy rather. Uh, Andrea Masi is his Achilles tendon, and then France lost Johan Uge uh, with an ACL injury as well, and that's a big blow for them, a massive blow actually. Uh, Jivan, you think that France showed enough uh, enough talent and enough skill uh, to actually go through a final, uh, to, uh, to a squad final? The problem that I have with France um, under um, um, Philippe Saint Andre is that they don't play like a French team. You see, uh, gone is the flair. You don't see much flair. But what you do, do see is a very well, very well drilled forward pack, you know, they are uh, technically quite sound which is normally not something which is generally associated with the French team, but they are very up and down, mm. you know. And I, you know, where is Wesley Fofana, he's not playing, you know, Playme Huje was somebody who brought a lot of, you know, a lot of spirit into the team and a lot of flair, he's out of the equation. So, where is all the flair gone, you know, and it's, it's not a French team, I, I, I don't, I think my Jaime will agree with me. When you want, when you see France play, you know, you want to watch France play the All Blacks because you feel that they have the flair and um, that X factor, you know, which is so French and we've seen it in World Cups, you know, it's a, they're, they're a World Cup special team. Mm. But this French side is very, very different, you know, they're very organized, no doubt, but they are, it's not a French team, you know, it's like watching, watching, um, you know, England team, you know, in, in, in blue and red. Oh dear, that's, uh, that's a severe <laughs> indictment. <laughs> <laughs> Jayan Fofana, no, in, in some Fofana way, may be back. You know, to, to add to what Jivan said, in some way it's like uh, Philippe Sanandre went across to the top 14 and picked out the, the 15 biggest players that they have in the league. Mm -hmm. You know, you find, uh, you know, Louis Picamoles is an absolute brute. Then you have Scott Spedding. Who, I mean, yeah. if you saw him on the park, you'd think he was a second row. He's huge. And they Matthew have Bastereau. Bastereau. Yeah. So, you know, uh, you can't expect the, the flair that you would associate uh, the French years of the uh, French teams of the years gone by. There's no Serge Blanco in there, I can tell you that much. Mm. You know, so they're, they're, they're building, a, uh, building it a lot a, a round, uh, around, you know, smashing teams up front and, and coping with that. But, uh, but once Fofana comes in, I think you might see a different French side, Shanaka. Yeah, I hope so. Really, it would be nice to see uh, Wesley Fofana. He's in my fantasy team and I didn't get any points for him. Uh, but uh, France, 32 points to 10. It was a dull game, probably one of the ugliest games of uh, this round. But uh, that brings us to where the group stand at the moment. And the group stands something like this. You'll see them on the screen. But surprise leaders uh, in the group, uh, guys, we have Wales leading in Group A. Uh, then we have Samoa, who are actually, despite a lackluster performance, leading in Group B. New Zealand, predictably, le uh, leading in Group C. And Ireland in group, uh, in group D. The interesting one is Group B. Who do you think is going to come up and top that group eventually? Uh, which group is, who's in that uh, uh, That group, one is South Africa, Scotland, oh, that, Samoa oh, and US. Oh, my goodness, Shanaka. <sighs> well, the heart would say Japan. But I think eventually it'll be the Springboks. I think the Springboks will bounce back. I, they had a bad day. I don't think it's anything that they did particularly wrong. It's just that, uh, you know, it was just a fateful day and they just happened to be the team, you know. Apart from the All Blacks, I think it could have happened to any other team in the world. And it was just, it just happened to be them that day. So, but I think they will bounce back. I don't think Heine Kime is a coach you want to have, you know, in your bad books for too long. Mm -hmm. You know, if he doesn't die of a heart attack, he'll probably, you know, whip you up and, and, um, and give you a thorough shelling and they'll be rearing to go. So I still say South Africa. I would like to think that Japan will come second or it'll be Scotland. It all depends on this weekend. Yeah, it should be interesting. And then you've got a banana skin for Australia against Fiji as well, John. Yeah, I think Fiji uh, would be a bit disappointed with how they went uh, in that first game. Uh, they, they have it in them, Shanaka, to, to take a top tier team all the way. Uh, if they can hold their set pieces, if they can compete at the scrums and, and not give away too much ball, uh, and if, if they can be in the game past the 50-minute mark, anything is possible. And I think teams like Fiji, teams like Samoa will take a lot of heart from what Japan did, Shanaka. I think that's another uh, effect that uh, has emanated from this Japan win. Teams like that will take a lot of heart and, and think, you know, guys, if these guys can do it, we are much stronger, we are possibly a bit more drilled than they are, why can't we do it? And I think uh, it's just thrown this World Cup wide open, Shanaka. Yeah, it's thrown the World Cup wide open and as Jayan said, anything can still happen. Jayan, Jivan, thanks very much for joining us on The Offload. Looking forward to talking to you uh, as the World Cup progresses. Some great stuff to look forward to. Midweek games as well. The pick of those games are going to be uh, the All Blacks versus Namibia. Let's see what the combinations are uh, for the Blacks and of course Australia versus Fiji. And then looking ahead next Saturday as well, we have uh, Wales taking on the old foe England 
Let's see how that goes. Join us on thepuprey.com.